just to tell a little something, and then all of a sudden, uh, these other wave friends of mine sent me these papers from Dayton, which is where we were sta stationed, with all this information about our work there. And so I said, I've just got to this. So that's one reason why I called down. Well, I'm grateful. Um, let me begin by saying it's, uh, it's Thursday, mm -hmm. the 25th of August, and I'm speaking with Scott Fire at the Athens Regional Library. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Fire, would you tell me something of your experiences during the era of World War II? Yes. Can I begin bef uh, before I went into the waves? By all means. Okay. Um, I don't know whether anyone has previously mentioned the air raid wardens, have they? You know? Not so much. Uh -huh. I'd like to hear about well, that. Well, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Athens, and I'm sure most places, was divided into areas, and each area had a, a couple of air raid wardens. We had armed bands, and uh, <coughs> when the air raid warden founded, uh, we would get our flashlights and put on, I believe we had, did we have anything on our heads? I'm not sure, but I remember the armbands. And of course, the, everyone in our area, in the homes, would pull down their shades so that it was absolutely dark. And we would go out with our flashlights and use them. We need, needed them, you know, to see if anyone had forgotten to pull down their shades. And this was our job to be sure there was a complete blackout. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. But uh, <clears throat> then is, um, we did that for a while, and then some friends and I took a home nursing course, just in case we needed to know more about nursing in case of uh, an emergency of some kind, an air raid, a real air raid uh, attack, whatever, you know. And I took it because I really wanted to um, learn how to birth a baby, but we didn't touch that. <laughs> So I was disappointed, but it was a good course. And then uh, girls in, our, uh, in Athens began to sign up for the different services. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, I had a neighbor across the street who uh, joined the Waves. I had a friend who joined the WAX. And my um, uncle's brother-in-law was commander of the uh, Coast Guards. So I had three real choices. But I chose the waves because of the uniform. Now, doesn't that sound like a woman? <coughs> and the uniforms were just real attractive. And uh, because um, I had a college degree and a few other things, I uh, qualified for officer's training school. So <coughs> our training was at Smith College, Northampton, Massachusetts. We had three months there. And it was, it was great. It really was. Um, it was, it was hard work. We walked um, 10 miles a day or drilled or took a PE or whatever, but we were always doing something. And I, I said that uh, my foot grew from size eight and a half to size nine and a half in three months' time. But when uh, <clears throat> the course was over, when the training was over, um, many of us were sent to Washington, D.C. They had a huge waves barracks there. And we were there just a couple of months, and then some of us were sent to Dayton, Ohio. Now, Dayton, Ohio, of course, has nothing to do with the sea. But we were sent out there, and we were um, housed at the summer camp belonging to National Cash Register. And we worked in a National Cash Register building. What we did was highly secret, and we were told that if we told anybody what we were doing, we would be shot at sunrise. I'm not sure whether they'd wait for sunrise or not. But anyhow, we knew that it was extremely secret. And uh, for years and years and years, only until about 10 years ago, I guess, nobody said anything about it. But then um, word began to leak out. And of course, the war was over. And what we did uh, was no longer um, of use to anybody. So uh, books were written and stories were told. <coughs> And um, we can now let the world know that we were um, responsible, really, for breaking the German code in many instances. And that helped to sink um, 
some of the uh, submarines, the German submarines. Uh, and uh, I didn't know whether you'd want me to um, uh, tell a little more detail or not. <coughs> Said uh, female naval volunteers working at the National Cash Register during World War II didn't attract much notice as they marched from the sugar camp, that's the summer camp I was telling you about, um, to Building 26 downtown. Even in an official National Cash Register history made public in 84, and that isn't too long ago, the 600 waves are given only passing mention in one photo caption, and it says, waves housed at sugar camp in 43 took accounting machine courses. See, nobody knew what we were doing except about five, I think, National Cash Register people. And then the waves, and we didn't know what we were doing, really. Uh, <coughs> People tell me they remember seeing the waves, but m never paid a lot of attention to them. Yes, waves and national cash were involved in a project so important and so secret that details of what went on in Building 26 remained classified until about 10 years ago. And the whole operation was uh, referred to as magic. We didn't know that, but that's how those in charge referred to it as magic. Between 43 and 45, the waves assembled about 200 sophisticated code-breaking machines called bombs, and that's spelled with an E, B-O-M-B-E, -E, bombs. The machines were based on similar machines devised in England, but the National Cash Register science, scientist Joseph R. Desch made significant improvements, and uh, we have learned that actually uh, Mr. Desch was uh, a super scientist, and what he did was remarkable. The sad part is he died before all this came out. You know, of course, his family is uh, getting recognition now, but he did not really get the recognition. In 45, uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower sent a letter to the British military that information from intercepted German messages saved thousands of British and American lives no small way contributed to the speed with which the enemy was routed and eventually forced to surrender. Ironically, it was the crucial importance of the work at National Cash Register that kept the public from knowing about it. <coughs> and, and where was your office? That, at that, that National NCR? Cash Register. Uh -huh. And the building had this huge chimney on the front of it and across the chimney was written we are a part of all we have met, Tennyson. It wasn't that fitting. Here we were from everywhere. Is that Tennyson's Ulysses? I'm not sure. I think so. It could be. But what city? That was... That was... Dayton, Ohio. Yes. Dayton, Ohio. Uh, this, let's see how much I want to tell you. Uh, a little bit more. Desch's research, see, already National Cash was uh, openly producing bomb fuses, now that's the bomb without the E, bomb fuses, shell casings, and aircraft carburetors. But Desch's work in Building 26 remained secret. See, everybody knew about the others. Uh, and of course, when the Navy found out about uh, Desch and what he was doing in these areas, then they contacted him uh, to work on this. The, the um, English had, um, as I think I mentioned it earlier, had already made bombs, but they were all of them, they weren't effective. And uh, so uh, Desch got busy, and uh, the thing, the ones that he made were more effective, they were faster. Um, maybe I'll read this. The British developed the first bomb, a machine to decipher the codes, but late in the war, the Germans modified their enigma, making the British bombs ineffective. Desch worked with British scientists to develop the American bomb to decipher the updated codes. It was fast, by 42 standards, and could do the work of six British bombs. Okay. Uh, then, uh, when the uh, war was over and uh, the waves were shipped out, all pieces of their work was destroyed. They burned it. Some of it was destroyed bushels of stuff forever. Um, the secret of the Allied code-breaking capability became commonly known after Winter Bottoms the was published in 1984. You know that. I've heard okay. of the book, yes. Okay. 
Oh. But could that you tells. talk about it at all? Uh, no. Did you feel comfortable talking about it? No, not not years, just till, just recently. Only just recently. recently. Only I feel recently. Very privileged. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And see what we did. Um, we uh, at National Cash. The bombs themselves were produced there for a while, and then uh, they were sent to uh, Washington, D.C. And then what we did, the waves in room 26, we made the components. They're called rotors, and they were small um, little things. They were called wheels, but they didn't look like wheels to me. Um, we wired using different colored wires to, uh, uh, hmm, but the, what? anyhow points on the uh, wheel and of course you could do uh, hundreds and thousands of different um, hmm what do I want to say well one girl could uh, wire one one way and another girl could wire at another way and another and so on you know and every day we wired them all different ways because you never knew which one uh, was the right way. Uh, it depended on the code you were trying to break. Um, now there was something in here I wanted to see. Did you have but, a sense that you were code breaking? Yes. You knew what I, they were I, for? Yes, yes, I felt like it. Because we had had uh, a, a course in uh, codes and code breaking and code making in the, uh, our training, and it just was logical, I think, to think that. The tremendous pressure put on Desch and the men of the electrical research lab was directly related to events in the Atlantic Ocean. I think this is interesting. The United States Navy was reacting to accelerated German submarine operations, which delivered a heavy blow to Allied shipping. In November and December of 41, German U-boats were responsible for sinking 100,000 tons of Allied shipping. In the first seven months of 42, however, U-boats overall sank 681 ships of 3,556,999 gross tons for a monthly average of slightly more than half a million tons. And uh, that's when they decided they needed help from us. Are you quoting again from the, the history of the NCR company? Yes, right. Uh -huh. And this was written by Mr. Desch's daughter. This, uh, and that's a picture of him. Uh, the first codes break, broken by the United States were done at National Cash in May of 43. Let's see. The deciphered codes were sent to Washington for further decoding of this, I think I've told. Um, Washington said this was one bit of information, that this one bit of information paid for the total cost of the program. It revealed the location and time a German sub cow that's the submarine, would rendezvous with three or four U-boats for refueling 350 miles off the New Jersey shore. Planes were sent out and destroyed the sitting duck, surfaced submarines. Up until this time, U-boat wolf packs raised havoc with the supply ships headed for Europe. The Atlantic Highway had to be open for the planned build-up to take the offensive in Europe. 120 bombs were built at National Cash Register and operated there until September 43, when they were, I said, moved to um, Washington. The National Cash Register bombs were credited with singing, sinking over 100 submarines. I think that's just fantastic. I have read some of the more recent uh -huh. history to where <coughs> credit is given, mm -hmm. where credit is due mm -hmm. for the magic Really good. And uh -huh. it, it, it has a huge uh -huh. effect upon changing the history when you when you when you're privy to some of the intelligence That's right. after That's right. after thirty or That's fifty right. years, um, right. one I must have been very proud. Very one interesting uh, side note: my sister was also in the waves, but she was an enlisted person, and um, uh, her uh, group and she stayed in Washington the whole time was responsible for breaking the Japanese weather code, because you see it depended on the weather. Uh, what operations they uh, performed and where they went and when they went. And so they were responsible for that. Uh, does that cover the um, work at National Cash? You that think? covers a little bit of territory. Yes, uh -huh. ma'am. Okay. Would you show off now this I have, photograph? Yeah. I, have, I have things um, that I wanted to share with you that uh, this is uh, a group of the waves. And we marched for the first, let's see, I was there almost um, two years. And the first 
year, I guess, we marched. But after that, um, they let us relax and just walk. <laughs> and we had to walk uh, from, they called it Sugar Camp, which was the summer camp for National Cash. And uh, they, where they brought uh, them time and, and gave them um, special training courses. But they let us have it. And they were so good to us. It was just amazing how good they were. And uh, they had to winterize it for us, too, because we were there over the winter. Uh, this is my air raid warden uh, little card. And this is my mustering out of the uh, waves. I, I have this for you. You said you were interested in that. We'll get to that. I'm very interested. Uh, and um, I wanted to say that um, everything was so good to the waves. You know, um, if we got on a bus and it was good, everybody jumped up to give us a seat. And we got tickets to the opera in uh, Dayton, and uh, we were just, the Navy's good to their personnel anyhow, but they were, I thought, just real good to us. And we felt real, uh, we were conscious of the fact we were um, being treated well, but also that we were sending boys to uh, fight. And this cartoon um, uh, gentleman in his uniform says, take my chair, ma'am, I've got a ship waiting for me and uh, so she has come in to relieve him. But this is uh, what we knew. I wanted to read it. In the year 1943 came a certainty. The partisans of life had grown stronger than the mechanized conspiracy of death. The Allies had started to break the axis. The man of the year did not live to take the bow. He died in Tunis on Tarawa at Salerno on the blood-soaked fields around Kiev, Kharkov. He lost his face, his limbs, and his mind before flamethrowers, in the cockpits of blazing planes, in the insane shadows of the jungle. He had badly wanted to live. When he died, the world had lost a particle of its meaning. But his death added more meaning than it took. It gave the living another chance to abolish the ugly crime of war. The soldier who died was the father of the unborn future. And uh, I, I just feel like uh, people need to know that those who survived felt that. I mean, they knew that. I, I think I see on there from Time magazine. Yes. Of January 3rd, 1944. Thank you. Yes. Okay, and this is prayer of a wave. Let me zero in on this. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um. <coughs> Dear Lord, as I kneel down to pray, I have so much to ask. My prayers are for the strength to serve a nation's mighty task. I need the grace with which to wear in dignity and pride my uniform and take with it its meaning in my stride. Teach me, O oh Lord, obedience, that I may do my best until our country once again is peaceful and at rest. And having these to guide me while our Navy's in the war, I have but then to thank you. I cannot ask for more. Thank you for our country, for our people free and brave, and make me ever worthy, Lord, to be a Navy wave. And that was written by Mary Munnett, a Prentice Seaman. Now then, um, I don't know what all you want me to I'm do. enjoying this very much. Uh, can you hold the cartoons and your cards once more for me? Yes, I can see. capture these in a sort of a still photograph. This, this cartoon? Yes, just let me... Okay. Got it. There. Let's see. Yep. Got them. Good. All right. What else have you got? Mm. This. I don't know where this came from. <laughs> probably somewhere in uh, Washington. I am a woman accepted for voluntary emergency service. That's the word wave. I didn't say that at the beginning. Thank you. I needed to hear mm -hmm. that. I have put behind me the small pleasures of home and kin and old friends to take my place with the men of the Navy. Wherever in the clear skies by day or the thundering black of night the guns are truer, it is because I am doing a man's job in the way of a woman here at home. I do a man's job, 
but I remain the eternal feminine, mindful of the small graces and the day when my duty is done, when home and hearth can be again paramount in my heart. When it is done, when I go back to my frills and flounces, let it be said of me only that I served well, proudly, and in the finest tradition of the Navy. Now, uh, these, I think, are all, uh, well, I, I did say this. Yes, this. You probably have this. I don't in, have in it. You may have it on, on, on um, there. Got it. Okay. Let me see. Now. You may have it on microfilm. This is. Had you this been north BJ. before you went to Smith College and then to Dayton? Yes. Uh -huh. Where had you been? Um, I had been all the way to New England. I had oh, been to Massachusetts mm -hmm. and uh, I visited Washington uh, quite a few times. This is um, the Dayton Journal. Uh -huh. And this was that would the have Normandy been June invasion. 1944, I've got it. Nor isn't that the Normandy invasion, Allies land in it France? Certainly is. And um, I, re I remember that distinctly. I didn't know at the time, but by the end of the day we knew. Um, we were at Sugar Camp, of course, and as we left our cottages to go to the dining hall, the entire area was shrouded in fog. It was the most eerie feeling, and then to know that this was going on, you know, it, I'll, I'll never forget that. Did you hear from the radio or from other people? Radio. Do you remember whose voice you heard? No, I wish I did, I don't. No, I, I don't want to get to that first. Um, let's see. Roosevelt, Roosevelt died. But I think I had something else here. No, I guess this is it. A, a saddened capital page. This is the Evening Star, Washington. And the waves marched in the funeral procession. I wasn't one of them, but they did march. I did see the procession. Got it. Thank you. Okay. And then, let's see, um, which came first? I should have had this better organized. But, uh, oh, this this is... Uh, How old were you during those years, may I ask? I've forgotten. It's, uh, subtract 13 from 45. All right. That's it. I was 30-some. This is um, May the 9th. When the lights went on again, this was uh, the war in Europe was over, May 9th. When the lights went on and we were in Washington and um, everybody w came out on the streets and walked up and down, it was um, just a night to remember. Got it? That was in Europe. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? Oh, yeah. Glory, 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 she remains. Yes, the lights went on again last night in our national, nation's capital as they did in London, Paris, and other capitals of liberated Europe. And here, as in a trance, a little group stands mesmerized before the dazzling sight of the capital, shining in all its heroic splendor. On the dome, the sturdy Statue of Freedom rises, isn't that nice, out against the dark sky. And this wounded soldier, the woman, Tiny girl, know what it means. Half the war, at least, is won. And then comes the end. This is the 14th. Truman announces the war is over. This is uh, the Washington Daily News. The Washington Daily News. So uh -huh. it is. I got it. And then this is the Washington Post. And. Were you in Washington at that yes, time? Yes, I, I was. Uh -huh. I had left Dayton and I was in Washington. Thank you. And this, <coughs> I had it right here. In Washington, were you working for NCR? No, just the Navy. The waves. Uh -huh. The waves, and and we were uh, we were uh, working for the Navy. The waves were 
a part of the Navy. And <clears throat> this came out. Um, I lived in Louisville, Georgia. My family and I, from the time I was um, 10, no, until uh, 5, until I was 10, you know, and Louisville was at one of the capital of Georgia. You knew that. I didn't remember that. Yes. That, it was the capital when, I believe, when the uh, university charter was drawn up, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a slave market there. You, did you know that? Didn't. And, and it, what, what county it, was Louisville? Jefferson County. Thank you. And it's near? Uh, Louisville is not too far from Augusta. Thank you. And um, Virginia Powell Hill Price, whom uh, I knew personally, uh, wrote for the paper. And this she wrote uh, after the war. <clears throat> says, market house bell rings out again. The slave market had a bell in it. Mr. Schott from the barber shop next door ran in the office and said for me to come quick. At last the radio had something to say. Nearly everyone had left Broad Street and gone home, and so Mr. Schott sat in one barber chair and I sat in the other, and the little shine boy stood there and watched Mr. Schott twiddle the radio dials. Then there was the quick staccata voice giving the momentous news. Japan had accepted the terms of surrender. Without a word, Mr. Schott and I shook hands, and with tears streaming down my face and blinding my eyes, I ran down, ran down the street. At that moment, I heard a sound that the people of our town have not heard for these many years. The musical voice of the old bell in the old market house pealed. The old bell cast in France over 150 years ago has not been used because we deem it too precious for use. Its voice was heard when the colonies gained their independence. Its voice was heard when the Confederacy won its early victories in the war between the states. Perhaps the last time that it was used was for the armistice in that November nearly three decades ago. But today, the rich tone rang out with a certain note of dignified authority above the din of fire siren, church bells, car horns, and the delighted screams that came from overburdened hearts. Who had authority to ring the old bell? Who had the honor of pulling the worn cord? All of us ran to the old market house because it represents the heart, the soul of Louisville. With his crutches under his arms and his face wreathed in smiles, one of our fine fighting men recently released from an amputation center was ringing the bell. By what right, indeed, he had pledged his life and sealed the pledge with his blood to make the moment possible. Ring out, old bell, till all the world is free from aggression. But the note of the old bell is not half so deep and free and joyful as the joyful hearts of the people who are saying in their hearts and with their tongues and songs, God, us the victory. Isn't that great? Wonderful. And then it tells about uh, Athens blew off the lid last night. Tells about that. That's VJ Day. That's VJ Day. And it tells all about Athens. It was not disorderly, it was just everything just erupted. Okay, now this was in um, the Washington Post. You may see the comic strips behind it. <laughs> yes, that's my favorite part. However, this is fascinating. I've got it. Thank you. And it's this is from the Hecht Company, one of the big uh, stores in Washington. For those who have borne the nation's battle, for those who have suffered the nation's scars and wounds, for those who have paid the last full measure of devotion. Ms. Lincoln. Byer, I've got um, another interview to do today, oh, but I'd okay. like to ask you whether I could speak with you um, again at length. Um, maybe I could, could come to your house on Cobb Street. Okay, like okay. Let's see if I can gather all this. I don't organize anything. I just you know, I don't put either. things together. <laughs> um, when did you return to Athens? Uh, Christmas of 45, is that right? Yeah. I left in um, April of uh, 43. Is that right? Yeah. The war was over in 45. This, uh, you said you wanted to know. Yes, it doesn't tell I, you a whole lot. Could I uh, Xerox it and return it to you? And another thing I wanted to say was because the women now are going to have a memorial. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Um, it's going to be beautiful. Well, I believe. Um, 
When did you move to the place you're living on Cobb Street? In uh, 32. Oh my gosh. See, we, we lived in Louisville and then we moved to Montezuma and graduated from Montezuma High and the depression hit. And um, daddy worked for the, um, oh, you've got somebody. <laughs> you've got somebody you know, waiting for you. I, I hope to get back in touch with you actually. Okay. Because uh, I have a lot of other questions I'd like to ask you. And um, would that be all right? Yes, if yes. I have